In this video, we're looking at conductor protection and ampacities, largely by considering table 310.16, a portion of which I have drawn here, just the upper left-hand corner, and some other code sections, all from the 2020 National Electrical Code. But before I look at the table, let's begin back in Article 240, which is all about overcurrent protection. So we have to ask, why are we as electricians so concerned with overcurrent protection of equipment? Or in this case, specifically conductors. Well, let's consider what happens if I have a conductor and I run increasing amounts of current through it. As the amount of current increases, so does its temperature. It gets hotter and hotter, and it may reach a temperature where it starts to do damage to connected equipment or even to itself, such as breaking down its own insulation. And so how would I protect that conductor? Well, generally speaking, we have an overcurrent protective device, a fuse or a circuit breaker that feeds a conductor. And if that conductor draws too much current for too long a period of time, based on the characteristics of the overcurrent device, the device will open, stopping the current flow and thereby protecting the conductor and anything down line from that overcurrent situation. Well, let's jump in. 240.4, protection of conductors, reads like this. It says, general, uh, it says uh, conductors other than, and then it lists a couple types that are talked about in dot five, but generally speaking, conductors shall be protected from overcurrent based on their ampacities found in 310.14. But before I go here, I gotta finish my sentence. It says, use these ampacities unless otherwise permitted or required in 240.4 A through G. These subsections here allow certain permissions or have restrictions. A permission might look like a conductor that appears to be protected by an overcurrent device that is too big for its size. Think of motors, tap conductors, welders, other things. And, and they're specified in these subsections. It tells you where to go in the code to make safe installations in those circumstances. And a restriction we're gonna bump into shortly is in 240.4D for small conductors. We'll see that in a little bit. But generally speaking, we're using the ampacities in 310.14. And it gives me two options in there. I can do a bunch of calculations under engineering supervision, or more from an electrician's perspective, it says, look at 310.15. And in there, I'm given any number of tables to use, a half dozen of them. Table 310.16 down through dot 21. So again, I have to finish the sentence. It says, use these tables as modified in 310.15 A through F. And we will talk about some of those in a couple moments. So I'm gonna pick table 310.16, largely has to do with the conditions of use. If I look in the section here, it lists those conditions. And in the title here, as well as the title of the table, it says, use this table for conductors that are run in raceways, think conduits, tubing, wireways, or cables, Romex cable, MC cable, anything where I have a bunch of conductors in a common sheath, or directly buried in the earth. Think of UF or US ca uh, USE cable underground. Okay? And that's why this table is one of the most frequently used in the code book, because those conditions cover a large swath of what we as electricians do. Okay, another thing I wanna see in the title is that it says, use these ampacities for insulated conductors with not more than three, three what? Not more than three current carrying conductors. 
So right away you go, Dave, many times I've had a conduit with way more than three conductors in it. Can I use these ampacities? Well, yes. Remember that modified thing back here? In 310.15c, it says use the ampacities from the tables, but it answers the question if I have more than three of them, subsection C. Too much for this video, but what it basically tells me is I would use one of these ampacities and then derate it. I would have to take that number and reduce it slightly. So instead of having all those conductors at their top ampacity, and then they're kind of mutually heating each other up past their insulation ratings, we take all those conductors and restrict their ampacities. And so when they run at their new limits, sure, they heat each other up, but they don't get over their temperature ratings. In C, that's referred to as ampacity adjustment. Another adjustment, uh, well, another question that comes up here, what is a current carrying conductor? Well, let's think about it. The ground, would I count that? No, it doesn't carry current, not in normal circumstances. Now, let's not get confused when we're talking conduit fill. How big of a conduit do I need for all the conductors I'm using? I count the ground there because it takes up space. That has to do with, you know, pulling in or pulling out conductors, not doing damage. So I count it there. But here we're more concerned about heat. What's generating heat? And the ground does not generate heat, so we do not count it here. The hots or ungrounded conductors, yes, we count those, they're carrying current. But the debate often comes up on the job site, do I count the neutrals as current carrying conductors? Now we know from our theory that yes, they carry current, they are the return path. So they're carrying current, but do I count them here? Again, too much for this video, but that's answered in dot 15 E. The quick answer, Sometimes I count the neutral, sometimes I don't. Another place I might have to make an adjustment is, well, it's in the conditions of use, but it's also listed uh, down here in note one at the bottom of the table. It has 30 degrees Fahrenheit, which equates, uh, excuse me, 30 degrees Celsius, which equates to 86 degrees Fahrenheit. So if I'm running my conduits or cables, in an ambient air temperature that is greater than 86 degrees Fahrenheit, I need to take my ampacities and adjust them down a little bit. That's in dot 15 B as in boy, and the code refers to that derating as temperature correction. Next thing I wanna look at is that I only drew a small portion of the table. I just drew the copper side and a little bit of that. I didn't get into the bigger conductors. But there are three other columns that deal with aluminum, right? Copper on the left, aluminum on the right. Main thing I want you to notice now is that for the same size wire, a number eight copper or a number eight aluminum, the ampacities in the respective temperature columns are going to be lower in aluminum. Why do we have to have a smaller limit of ampacity on aluminum conductors. Again, goes back to our theory. Aluminum has more resistance than copper and is therefore less conductive. So given the same size wires with the same amps, the aluminum would run hotter than the copper. What it generally means is when using aluminum, we have to use a slightly bigger wire than we would with copper. And there's reasons for using aluminum. It's lighter, it uh, costs less but that decision has to be made. Okay. Oh, and uh, uh, aluminum and copper, where is that in the code? You'll get a good beginning of that if you look in 110.5, establishes what metals we can use generally, and 310.3 uh, gives more characteristics of the conductors. One thing I'll alert us to here is 310.3a says, unless allowed other places in the code, Generally speaking, for power, the smallest size conductor in copper is a 14, partially why we have these dashes up here. If you look on the aluminum side, the dashes go all the way through size 14. That's because with aluminum, the smallest size is generally 
a 12. Okay. Next, I want to look at these temperature columns. And you see some insulations above those. I didn't draw them here. But those insulation types, generally speaking, mean that, let's just pick a number 8. If I run 40 amps on it, it shouldn't exceed 60 degrees Celsius. And the insulations listed there are good up to 60 degrees Celsius. If I run, say, 50 amps on it, it'll get hotter, but it won't exceed 75. And those insul insulations can handle 75 degrees Celsius. And likewise, if I run a few more amps, it'll get a little hotter, but shouldn't exceed the 90 degrees Celsius rating of the conductors listed here. We'll get into the uh, insulation types in a little bit, but to understand these temperature columns, again, we've got to go back to the beginning of the code, Article 110.14c. That's easier to understand if I draw a picture. You might think in this scenario with a 40 amp breaker and THHN wire that I can look at the table, find THHN in the 90 degree column, go down and look for 40 amps and say number 10 will be adequate. But let's consider what happens if I put a number 10 in there. If I run 40 amps on a number 10, is that conductor likely to get up close to 90 degrees Celsius? Sure. And we gotta think of copper and aluminum, not just as good conductors of electricity, but they are excellent conductors of heat. So if I have a number 10 that's running 40 amps, it could approach a much higher temperature than the circuit breaker is rated for, or than this attached wire here. And what would happen? That heat would transfer to the internals of the breaker, potentially doing damage. Or on this conductor, the heat would transfer into this wire, and it could potentially damage the insulation that's actually rated for a much lower temperature. So what 110.14c tells me is that I have to pick an ampacity for this wire, from the column with the lowest rating of any connected termination, conductor, or device. In this case, I'm looking at 60 degrees. The breaker is rated for 60 degrees. This uh, connected wire rated for 60 degrees. And, and this, well, this lug, what, what's this? So you don't generally see a temperature rating stamped on a lug, but what you do see is something like this. It lists the types of metals that the lug can be used with, aluminum or copper, and there's a number in there. A seven would indicate it's rated for 75 degrees Celsius, and a nine would indicate 90 degree rating. Okay. Now, there, there is a general rule in 110.14c1a that says for conductors 100 amps and less, you're limited to the ampacity in the 60 degree column, which would mean here that 40 amps, I'd need a number eight. And if I did that, I put a number eight in there, that conductor, because it has more copper in it, would not get as hot. And therefore it couldn't overheat the connected terminations conductor device. But let's look what this might look like in a newer system because C1A3 tells me, hey, if everything connected is at a higher temperature, then I can use that higher temperature rating. Here, everything connected is rated at least 75 degrees. Don't get concerned with that 60 there. A lot of breakers have this 60 slash 75. It's a, it's a technical way of writing it so that yes, you could use that breaker with a 60 degree conductor, okay? So let's say you're putting the breaker in an old building with 60 degree conductors, you can use that breaker there. It's just a technicality there. But here we're looking at the 75. And so I could take this THHN and use the ampacity from the 75 degree column 
which could I use a number 10? No, too small for the breaker here. Plus we'll find out something else later. But I'd have to use a number eight, but look at this. Since they're all rated 75, I could actually run 50 amps on there. If I wanted more power here, I could up that to a 50 amp breaker if I wanted. Okay. Now, dot 14 c one b has the general rules for uh, over 100 amps. And that general rule is in the 75 degree column. Now, you're not gonna find breakers in the 90 degree column, at least I haven't seen them. So, so you're going, why even have the 90 degree column? Well, remember that thing about more than three conductors or the ambient air temperature, those modified section, uh, subsections here, dot 15 B and C, where we take this ampacity and modify it down? Well, it's actually in the second sentence here, or in the second paragraph here, where it allows me to use the higher temperature rating if the conductor is rated for that. So I could start, if I have a THHN, I could start with the 90 degree column, do my adjustments or corrections, as long as I don't end up higher than whichever other column I need to be restricted to. Okay. A couple other things I wanna point out with the insulations that I didn't draw up here, but are in each column. Okay. That means that that conductor can handle that temperature for an extended period of time. Okay, look at a couple things. In the 75 and the 90, you're gonna see XHHW. So what gives? Is it 75 or is it 90 degree rated? You've gotta look at this table. This table, 310.4A, gives me more information than I want about insulations. But what it tells me if I look under the applications for XHHW is that in a wet location, I'm restricted to the 75 degree column. And in dry or damp locations, I can use the 90 degree ampacity. Okay. There's another thing here. So again, the 75, you see THWN. And then in the 90, you see THWN-2. There's several of the insulation types have a dash two version over here. Again, look at the table on insulations and it'll tell me that the dash two version is good to 90 degrees in dry, damp, even in wet locations if I'm using the dash two version. So in class, I would often ask, what conductors are you pulling on the job site? And because most people in class were on commercial job sites, it would say, but THHN. Then I would ask, are you pulling that THHN in wet environments? Hmm, is it rated for wet? Look here, it's, it's damp and dry. And I'd say, are you pulling it in, conductor, in conduits that go underground? Because underground is considered wet location according to the code. Scratch your head a little bit. Take a look at this. Here I have a couple of conductors. And as we notice, they're both, the white one and the black one, rated for THHN, 90 degrees, in damp or dry. But they're also rated for something else, or THWN or THWN2 in the case of the black wire. So in wet locations, the white wire is only rated to 75, but the black wire to 90. And then these have um, other ratings as well. MTW is machine tool wiring. Uh, that's kind of like the oil up here. And uh, AWM, that's not in your code book. It's about appliance wiring, so don't worry too much about that. Um, but the main point I'm trying to make is this dual rating of the wire. So therefore, that conductor that you were thinking was THHN, actually can be pulled underground or in a wet environment because it's rated for that as well. So look at the wires. Those ratings are listed every couple of feet along the wire and also look for the temperature ratings of what you're connecting to. Consider those things. Last couple things here. The asterisks on the smaller conductors. Whenever you got that, you look down at the bottom Ah, that's that restriction on small conductors. And what it tells me is 
unless specifically allowed in 240.4 E and G, a number 10 copper cannot be on anything bigger than a 30 amp breaker. A number 12, nothing bigger than a 20 amp breaker. And a number 14, nothing bigger than a 15 amp breaker. Just happened to line up with the 60 degree column on those guys. Now, you could put a number 10 on a smaller size breaker. We do that for specific reasons, but nothing bigger than a 30, 12 on a 20, 14 on a 15. We want to have that association in our minds. The other things here are specific locations. Now, I put all of these under the 60 degree column for a reason. Article 334 is about Romex, or specifically in the code NM cable, non-metallic sheath cable. Now, towards the end of Article 334, I'm going to see that these wires need to have an insulation that is rated to 90 degrees. However, in dot 80, I can only use the 60 degree ampacity. It also specifies, like the second sentence here, or second paragraph here, it also specifies I can start with the 90 because that's the rating of the insulation, but I cannot end up above the 60 degree column ampacity. Okay. I don't have a sample of a 338 service entrance cable, but it, it, it can also be used for branch wiring. And when it is, this little section here, subsection, sub, sub, subsection, uh, says that if that SE cable is being used in branch and it's number 10 or smaller, it's touching thermal insulation, then I'm stuck with a 60 degree ampacity. And 340 is UF cable, I have a sample here, a really thick, heavy duty sheathing that can go underground. UF is also listed in this column. It comes in, in individual conductors or with a group of them in there. And this wire, in dot 80 of UF cable is restricted to the 60 degree column also. So I hope that's given us a, a better understanding of this table, code sections related to the table or that lead us there. And if you want more information on some of the other things, if they're not already there under the conductors playlist, I'm working on some videos for the subsections of 240.4 and the subsections of 310.15. So look for those coming if they're not already there under the conductor's playlist. Thank you.